Hi and welcome everybody. My name is Philip Tanzer. I am the candidate for the region Highlands and Islands for the Scottish Family Party in the upcoming Scottish election. And recently there were a lot of newspaper articles written about me because I'm running for quite a conservative party with um, strong views on like family values and um, also uh, LGBT education in schools and uh, transsexuality, but I used to be uh, a gay porn actor, uh, something that the party leader knew from the very beginning. That's actually how we started talking because I talked about with him about my past and um, he was very intrigued and I um, have very strong views regarding like porn addiction, the porn industry, um, LGBT lifestyles, and that's what actually brought me into the party. Now, I received quite a bit of backlash from the LGBT community, a lot of like toxic uh, comments, uh, some of them based on false information in some of the articles. Um, other stuff is simply because I uh, don't identify as gay anymore and I started dating uh, women so I'm a little bit of a class traitor I would say. Now I received a letter on Facebook or a message on Facebook by somebody from America who wrote about me um, and the fact that I run for the party and he asked me a lot of questions quite personal questions and many questions and I decided to do a video addressing these questions because they are valid questions and questions that I have been asked by several people and I hope I hope this video is informative uh, tells people a little bit about my journey where I'm coming from and my views and I will be 100% honest even if that might not sound political correct politically correct um, and if you don't believe that I'm honest, then there is no point in watching this video because I will say certain things that people will just say, oh, he's lying, but I'm not. Everything I'm going to say in this video um, is the truth and what happened and why I did certain things. Um, I don't use excuses because I don't need excuses. Um, okay, let's dive in. Um, there are certain parts of the letter that I left out because they were too personal and obviously I'm not uh, mentioning any names. Um, he wrote, I've been seeing a lot of you lately in the media and I find your story rather fascinating. First of all, I am a gay man. I am also a Christian. I agree with you on the trans issues. I think society is messing with kids' minds. I also think that porn is addictive and can become very harmful for some people. I used to watch quite a bit uh, of it and was a fan of yours. Um, now, I'm very uh, glad that you self-identified that you watch too much porn and later on in the letter um, he's saying that he almost completely stopped watching porn. That's really good. Uh, I think the fact that you're a Christian, I'm, I'm a Christian as well, and I would say that my faith is uh, growing, especially in the last two years, has, uh, has increased, especially my connection with the church, whereas before I was more a spiritual person, and now I'm becoming more attached to, to uh, Christian um, rules, I would say. Yes, rules. Okay. Uh, he continues, <clears throat> And as extreme as your films could be, there was always something about you that I sensed was kind and gentle, like boyfriend material, like family would be important to you, that you could be a pretty nice guy. Don't ask me why, I have no clue, but it's almost like it was being revealed to me. And then you were kind of gone from the face of the earth and I didn't really think of you anymore. Like I said, I was into porn. I used to drink heavily as well, but I've been sober for 18 years. Um, 
wow, that's that's really really impressive that you've been sober for such a long time, and um, I. I really hope that you will always stick to it and I hope that your uh, porn addiction that you're gonna deal with that um, just as well as with your alcohol addiction and I'm very glad to hear that you're doing well. Now in regards to the very kind and nice things that you said about me, I I think I always want try to bring something human to everything I, I did including my porn career. I sometimes I failed, I think, and I definitely didn't manage to to uh, to do as much as I wanted to. Uh, let's put it that way. He continues. I won't lie. I still watch it on occasion, porn that is, uh, when I really need a release. But I'm working on that. Uh, I do think porn destroys a lot of lives. Lives, yeah. I, I think porn is one of the most destructive um, influences that we have um, combined with social media and the media. I think it has a huge negative impact on on us and it um, it robs us from a lot of energy and clarity, I think. Um, I have been addicted to porn myself um, for some time and... Uh, in the last two years, I I, um, I at times stopped completely, and then I had some setbacks. Uh, but I'm I would say similar to you, I'm I'm doing pretty well. But every once in a while, it um, it, it comes back up. Uh, but it's not good. It's not good. I I do feel that it uh, takes away from my focus in life and from uh, working on the things that I really wanted to work on. Um, but I think hopefully I'm going to continue having the relationship that I have and that definitely helps to step away from, from that. Uh, yeah, and two things. If, if somebody watching struggles with uh, pornography, porn addiction, there are two things that I can recommend. One is an app on the telephone. It's called Fortify. Fortify. And it supports you with stopping to watch porn and it's brilliant it's really well done it asks you how you're feeling it gives you alternative things to do and it's very holistic so it tells you to spend more time with your friends and you have little tasks every day so i can highly recommend that and the second thing i can recommend is this book uh from a friend of mine um timothy regal it's called living porn free and it helps you to stop watching porn. Uh, this is with a Christian background. Um, so if you're already Christian, this is absolutely fine for you. If you're not Christian, I would say you should still have a look at it. And um, and I would say, I think the faith aspect really helps to stick with it. Because if you don't have faith, you can ask yourself, well, why should I stop? Or who, who, who holds me accountable? If you say, well, somebody's watching me, uh, then somebody does hold you accountable in some ways. Okay. Uh, he continues. Now, some of your films were much more extreme uh, than what I would call mainstream porn. And from what I understand, you were a Mr. Leather. Um, yeah. So that's true. I used to be Mr. Leather. And... Here's the first part of the story where people might question my how, how truthful I answer, but I'm 100% tr truthful in that regard. So I started going to gay bars uh, when I was around 18, 19, and I didn't like them at all. Uh, I The life or, yeah, the attitude was incredibly superficial. And at that time, I was a bit of a like punk goth. And I didn't fit in and people in the LGBT community are very judgmental, unfortunately, from my experience. And I ended up going to leather bars because uh, visually I fitted in much more. And the audience is quite a bit older and people were actually quite interested in conversations about um, like politics, God, society and stuff like that. I'm sure that wasn't why they went to these bars. But I ended up having really good conversations. And I was 
um, always an observer. So at that time, I wasn't sexually active. I would just sit in the bar in a dark corner and watch people and, um, and watch their social interactions. And I did see a lot of, I would say, dis- self-destruction, uh, drug addiction, and there was something quite dark about it. Also something that's fascinated me, no question about that. I was always interested in in dark parts of of society and life. And in a magazine, I saw a competition advertised for, uh, which was called German Mr. Leather Contest. And I always listen to my inner voice. Um, I think I have a strong connection to to God and what I'm supposed to do in my life. And this inner voice inside me told me that I should participate in that competition. And I was wondering why, because at that time I was, I was actually vegan. So I, I wasn't wearing leather clothes. Um, and my internal voice told me that it's, if I participate in this competition, I have a voice, I can communicate with people that need to hear the things that I've got to say. So I participated and I won as youngest Mr. Leather that was ever elected. And yeah, I I wrote a monthly column in a magazine and I went to a lot of uh, gay events, handing out condoms, uh, promoting safer sex and talking against uh, drug addiction and drugs and talking in favor of more tolerance in the scene. Very much, I would say, the same values that I still have. And after nine months, I was burned out because I was experiencing so much darkness and and it really pains me. It's very similar when I'm in a city and I see a lot of uh, homeless people. Uh, It's it's hard on me. I, I can't look away. So... After I finished my year as German Mr. Leather, I stepped away from the community, not because I didn't care about the people anymore. It's just because I felt like I did what I could do and I had to step away. Um, Later on, I I didn't have any money left. I I made money when I was uh, in the military for three years. And after that, I was just working as a DJ and bartender. And even though I didn't spend a lot of money, I really didn't. At one point, I I needed money. And due to my title as German Mr. Leather, I had connections to people that used to do porn or that were doing porn. And they were talking to me about it. And they said, oh, it's really good money. And actually, they had really good experiences. Now, I had a negative opinion about pornography. I was watching it, but I had a negative opinion about it because I thought the portrayal of sexuality was too negative and very superficial, very raw, and there was no emotional connection between people. And I thought maybe if I go into porn, I can bring something to the to that scene, similar to with the fetish community, with the leather community. Um, And by that time, I had recovered from my burnout. Um, So I thought, oh, let's do the next crazy thing. And yeah, but I'll get into that later on because um, he asked me a couple more questions about my time in porn. He continues, you identified as gay and now you state that you were forced to believe that. Who or what forced you? I mean, you were in your 30s not a kid. Um, He said that because the newspapers actually misquoted me and it it wasn't intentional, I I think. I identified as asexual with a tendency towards men when I was a teenager. Uh, I knew that I was attracted to men, but I didn't want to have sex and I uh, was very careful. And it was actually mainstream society that pushed me more and more into identifying as gay because I would tell people I'm asexual with a tendency towards men and they said oh so you're gay and I said no I'm blah 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 and they said no no you're gay you're gay and I said I I don't like that box and they said oh you're just afraid to get out of the closet and stuff like that which was complete nonsense uh 
just by the way I looked. I mean, I looked like a mix of Marilyn Manson and Alice Cooper and Prince. Uh, I, I wasn't shy about that. And my brother is gay, um, and I didn't have a problem with that. But after a while, the, the pressure was so so big of just having a label that I said, okay, well, if it, you need me to be in a box, then yeah, I'm, I'm gay. And if I could, I would go back to my 16-year-old self and I said, stick to your guns, um, stand up to, like, listen to yourself. Don't let society force you into a box and don't let so society force you into having sex when you're not ready to have sex because that that happened as well. And I'm not, it's, it was my decision, I'm not completely blaming society, but I wish there had been a more, um, I, I wish I would have heard more voices, not just the voice of sexual liberty and freedom, but also the voice of take your time and it's okay not to have sex and it's 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 okay to figure yourself out before you take action yeah uh in the newspaper article though it was written that i um changed when i was in my early 30s and they made it sound as if i changed towards being gay but that's actually when i changed towards being yeah, having relationships with women again and open my opening myself to uh, heterosexuality. Um, he continues, you say you went into porn because you needed money. But I mean, let's be honest, your porn didn't really focus on sex. It was things like um, S&M and abuse, fetish stuff. Um, if it was just for the money, why did you choose to go into such severe porn movies if it wasn't something you were into? Uh, why not just vanilla porn? <laughs> Again, I'm going to be 100% honest here. Uh, I'm, I'm not into fetish stuff. I find it interesting and I find it visually very interesting. Like, I, as I said, I was an Alice Cooper and Marilyn Manson fan. So that's how I got into that line of fashion. Uh, but in my private life, I actually didn't have any sex um, up to the age of 27 or almost no sex. And when I did have sex, I felt quite uncomfortable around it uh, with very few exceptions. But I did do uh, S&M performances. Um, but again, that was much more with my Marilyn Manson background, and it was not sexual for me. Um, it was more perform, much more performative. And in my later years, when I became more and more part of the gay culture, so to speak, I would actually use my performances as some kind of exorcisms. So I was invited to fetish parties and stuff like that and I would pro do performances on stage with fire and like like burning myself and it was much more like self-flagellation and trying to get rid of the demons from the room um, not always but in many many cases that was the case when I did these performances and in regards to the movies in the beginning of my career I actually did do almost exclusively vanilla movies and I was very very clear with the company that that's what I wanted to do and that I didn't want to do anything extreme. I did some extreme movies in the last year of my career and that was because I was intrigued. I was intrigued and the movies gave me an excuse to do something outrageous uh, without introducing it to my private life because in my private life I didn't do that kind of stuff. So I could, in a safe, safe environment, I know it sounds weird, but it is a kind of a safe environment and you can detach it from your private life. I could do certain things that I wouldn't have done in my private life. And for those who are old enough to remember the MTV show and movie Jackass, all my porn performances were much more akin to what the people in Jackass did. Um, it wasn't sexual. I didn't, I didn't enjoy doing these scenes. I, I didn't mind doing them because it was, for me, it was acting. Um, but it was, it was 
fascinating to act these things and also fascinating to learn things about myself and my body um, that I didn't want to learn in my private life. And yeah, in the last months of my career, I just said to the people doing the movies, oh, okay, let's just do the craziest stuff that we can think of or that we can get away with. So I, I did that. And it was the same like bungee jumping or parachuting or free climbing and stuff like that. So it was, was much more, let's see what kind of crazy, stupid stuff we can come up with. And again, that's not an excuse at all. That's just exactly how it was. Um, he's, he writes, and you said you went into porn thinking you could add something positive to it. What was it that you thought you could add to it? I thought I could bring human qualities to it. I thought that I could create scenes where you could see a connection between me and the other person and actually caring for each other. And I think I accomplished that in quite a few scenes, but definitely not most of them, because in the end, it's it's really hard work and um, it's an industry and you can't always pick who you want to work with. I was always able to say, no, I don't want to work with this person, but that would have also meant I'm not making that money. So I did sell my body for money and I think if anybody starts to is thinking about doing anything in that regard be very very clear about what you're doing because once you go down this route it's very very hard to come back from that and I did end up in situations where I would say I agreed to being raped and I'm not blaming the other person I don't blame the the company I do blame myself because I could have said no but out of professionalism and uh, not wanting to come across like a diva I agreed to certain things that I shouldn't have agreed to so uh, to everybody out there if somebody if you feel pushed into a corner to make a moral decision uh, be very careful and and choose Choose what feels right, not not the external pressures. Um, he asks, I understand that you now identify as bisexual and you have a girlfriend. Yes, I do have a girlfriend. Um, we have never physically met each other due to the uh, lockdown and she lives quite far away. But uh, we talk very, very clearly about um, having a family and uh, so we mean we mean business and uh, it's very serious and as to identifying as bi bisexual I don't like boxes and I'm still attracted physically to men but I don't want to be physical with men anymore and in my relationship I want to be 100% committed and so I would like to leave um, homosexual activities behind me. That doesn't mean I'm not attracted to men anymore. It just means that I don't have sex with them. Just like a man or a woman who enters a committed relationship, they agree to not have sex with other um, sex partners anymore. It's the same thing. So I'm not rejecting my homosexuality. I'm um, just in a committed relationship and I chose a heterosexual re uh, relationship but I'll talk about that in a bit. He asks, what I would like to know is if you have become anti-gay like I have read. That's the, that's the hardest question um, that you're asking because it can be answered yes and it can be answered no. Um, I, I've always been a very spiritual person. I've never been like a church person. I'm, I'm moving towards that a little bit now. I've always been a, a spiritual person, though, since I was a little kid. And I, I think that I can feel if something is off about people. Not always, but often. And in the LGBT community, I felt that there was something off about people way more often than in amongst straight people. Now, 
there are a lot of straight people that are off as well. But I think the percentage was much higher amongst the LGBT community. And when I say off, I don't mean that in a negative way or in, in a judgmental way. I might mean that in a compassionate way. There was something missing, something broken. And you do have very high numbers of like drug addiction, suicide rates, uh, and so on in the LGBT community. And some people say as an excuse, oh, that's just because of external homophobia. But that's that's complete bullshit um, because you have even higher numbers uh, in incredibly liberal and open um, societies and countries than in very restrictive countries. So I don't accept that explanation. I think there is something broken in most LGBT people. Now, I don't think that everybody needs to be whole. I think sometimes I'm broken in some ways, definitely, and healing these cracks is part of my life's journey, and I'm very thankful for all the uh, lessons that I can learn, but it's hard. It's, it's a hard path. And... I think that a lot of that brokenness in the LGBT community leads to depression, leads to mental health issues, um, and so on, suicide, drug addiction. And I don't know if that brokenness is there from the beginning, if the brokenness led to the LGBT identity or the other way around. I don't know. I really don't. But I would say... I wish that in addition to an affirming culture, like an LGBT affirming culture, I, I wish that there were many places where people can freely talk about their issues and say, oh, where does it come from? And I, I wish that scientists would continue looking into it and say, is it genetics? Is it early childhood experiences? Is it trauma? Um is it overcompensation for something? And I think in my case, it was overcompensating for a lack of, of masculinity in my, in my childhood. I was, I was obsessed with more masculinity um, in, in a father figure or a brother figure. And I would say that I sexualized that over time. I'm not sure if that's the only reason why I was attracted to men, but I, it, was, it definitely influenced it. Uh, and now to all the haters out there that say that I'm just in internally homophobic and stuff like that, I can just tell you how I feel. That's that's my truth. That's how I feel. That's my lived experience. Um, and yeah, now in regards to am I anti-gay, with young people that experience same-sex attraction, I would say... Take it slow. Ask yourself, where does it come from? Um, do you want to go through this door? And if you go through this door, do that in a careful way, in a very safe way, and um, don't succumb to external pressures. And I would never say to a person who, who has exclusively um, attractions to one sex i would never say oh you can't have that and you have to try with the opposite sex but i would say um try to keep an or door open and and see if you if you can see where your happiness lies not not just your lust and and the thing is the thing is if you only have same-sex attraction and you enter uh, like a heterosexual uh, relationship without, without being prepared for what that means, then you might not just destroy your own life, but also the life of your partner who you probably lie to because you don't love the person. So it's, it's very, very difficult. But that's why I'm, I'm in favor of... of um, therapies that can help you uh, dealing with these issues and they are being called conversion therapies and um, people that are against conversion therapies they portray them as electroshock uh, therapies because that did happen in the past and that's absolutely ab abhorrent and that should never happen 
um, and it was also forced upon young people and neither LGBT indoctrination should be forced on children nor uh, getting rid of same-sex attraction should be forced upon uh, children, um, especially not by like yeah forced therapy and stuff like that. But for adult people, there should be help available um, challenging their attractions and challenging porn addiction, challenging sex addiction, challenging LGBT um, at same sex attraction, for example, or uh, transsexuality, if you want to change that. Very controversial, unfortunately. <laughs> but I don't think it should be controversial at all. Next question. Are you saying all desire for men and kinky sex have disappeared? Nope, absolutely not. Uh, I still do have same-sex attraction and it has definitely uh, declined over the years and it has gotten less and less and less and less. Mm, but it's not gone and I don't think that it will ever be completely gone and that's that's fine, just like straight people um, will always like find people of the opposite sex attractive. That doesn't mean they have to have sex with them. Um, and I do think, I have noticed that when I'm in a relationship with a woman that my attraction to a man is, is going down and down and down, but I don't think it will ever disappear. And in regards to kinky sex, was never really my cup of tea, still isn't. What is your stance on all the ink you have on your body? Well, my ink has to do with my faith and with the fact that I never felt at home in society in some ways. Um, I wanted to look different from other people and I've always felt that I'm a warrior um, fighting for what I believe to be important in society and what I believe to be true. That's why I'm running for the Scottish Family Party as well. And I was always very deeply connected to angels. And angels are the warriors of heaven. So I got myself a full body armor uh, with the tattoos on my head being the helmet. Yeah. And I'm still happy to have my, my ink. Next question. Are you saying that you are a born again Christian now and that is what changed you completely? Absolutely not. So my change had nothing to do with Christianity and faith. Uh, my faith, my change towards dating women simply came out of the fact that I did not see myself in a relationship with men. I tried it a couple of times knowing that it didn't feel right. And so when I was gay, I, I was like, well, I'm going to be single for the rest of my life um, and just have dogs. And then at the age of 32, I thought, you know what, I, I should probably try it with women again. It can't be that much worse than with men. And there was definitely something missing in my life. So I, I tried it out and it felt physically correct. And there was really something that I was like, oh, wow, that's what I was missing. That connection, that that physical and spiritual connection that that was missing. And shortly after that, after that first experience, I was in a relationship with a woman that was absolutely wonderful. And yeah, yeah, so... Um, and I would say, I would say that through all my life experiences and being a porn actor and doing this, doing that, doing that, I learned a lot about sexuality and I learned a lot about myself and I always reflected and I was like, this doesn't feel right to me. This doesn't feel right to me. And in the end, I just came closer and closer to uh, scripture and the Bible. And I said, well... That's so funny that that it says this in the Bible. And I came to that conclusion through experimenting with everything and saying, like, I'm at a point now where I'm not opposed to, obviously for me it's too late, but where I'm not opposed to the thought of no sex before marriage because there's something really strong and beautiful about saying, you know what, I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait for you and I will only share this intimacy with you and nobody else. Um, but then you have to make a really good partner choice, I think. Uh, so as I said, for me, it's obviously too late. Uh, no sex before marriage. But with my with the uh, 
the girl that I'm talking to now, we did talk about it and we said, well, should we maybe wait with the big step um, be up until the point where we are engaged um, or, or even be um, after marriage? I don't know if we're going to do that, but we'll see. We'll see. I think there's something very special, something very profound about it. Um, and yeah, I'm not a born a grand Christian. I was always a, a Christian, not strongly connected to the church. I think my connection to the church is going stronger, is growing stronger. But for a funny reason, actually, with the Catholic Church, uh, even though I'm a Protestant, and I'm well, I don't think I will change to the pre uh, Catholic Church. I'm, but I'm very open, and I'm listening to different teachers. And I would say the Catholic Church is closer to how I feel because they're closer to Scripture and they're much stronger in their their faith. And um, uh, a friend of mine, she made me aware of an online Christian, Catholic Christian thing. It's called a Theology of the Body. And I listened to a lot of their output. And I it was so... Uh, life affirming and so positive uh, also positive about sexuality but in within the context of marriage that i was like wow that's really empowering that's really beautiful and to me uh the topic of sexuality and and intimacy becomes much more interesting and much more beautiful now that i become more and more christian and with the restrictions that come with it so, next question. I'm so sorry. This uh, this uh, video is getting uh, longer than I thought it would be. I hope I don't bore you uh, watching it. Uh, next question. Uh, and that is in regards to the born-again Christian. He asks, um, what was the epiphany that you had? And I, I think my epith epiphany was lived experience and that my experience brought me to old teachings and you find very similar teachings in almost every religion, uh, almost the exact same things. It's like, what did these people know that we don't know anymore? What's that, that decades and centuries old knowledge that was passed on from generation to generation where they said, uh, this is how you should live. And, and let's be honest, uh, let's look at mon monogamy in the past. A mother needed, or a woman that fell pregnant, needed a man to provide and look after her. And, and society created structures to make sure that the man would look after the wife and that and that connection was marriage. Um, that obviously is not the, the Christian way of looking at it, but that's the way of like from a society standpoint. And, you shouldn't kill, you shouldn't lie. Why? Well, because there is absolute chaos in society if we do. And I think more moral values and more biblical or uh, Christian values and Western values um, are needed in our society. I think we see the decline of society um, because we, we think that we can make the rules. I think we can't. I think we're really, really bad at coming up with new rules. Um, so maybe we should have just thrown them out um, like the baby with the bathwater. Okay. So now the next question is a little bit uh, spicy. Um, did you ever have a boyfriend or just slut around? Well, I, I was really not the person to slut around. I did have, like, I would say two boyfriends even though uh, having like being in a relationship with a man didn't feel right for me. I tried. Um, I feel almost a bit sorry for my boyfriends because I couldn't give them what they they wanted. And I was, I would say, emotionally unavailable. But they knew what they got themselves into because I told them that I didn't feel the, 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 the relationship, the need for a relationship with them. Um, but I'm still very thankful for the experience and I hope they're doing well. Uh, and yeah, there was a very, a very, very brief moment in my life when I was slutting around. And as said before, it was more an experimental phase. It wasn't even for the sex itself. It was more for um, making experiences. And I would say 
uh, 80% of the sex was meaningless and um, empty. 10% was bad and um, yeah, bad emotionally. Something where you're like, shit, I, I really shouldn't have done that. And between 10 and 5% was, was good. And I would say, oh, that was two people that didn't use each other, didn't, um, and that shared something positive with, with each other. Um, but were the 90% needed just to have these 10%? Absolutely not. I think it would have been more productive to have like a stable relationship in my case with a, a woman and just saying let's let's make it ninety percent or eighty percent uh, positive instead of eighty ninety percent negative. Okay. Next question. I've not had much luck in the relationship area, but I um but I have seen many who do. I and I've been in love and would like to find another Christian man to be involved, involved with. I wish you all the luck in the world, and I know it's really hard. It's very hard in the gay community, and it's getting harder and harder in the straight community to find a partner who actually wants a committed relationship and who has similar values. I think, and again, even in Christian circles, I think it's it's hard. I all I can say is I, I wish you all the luck in the world and I really do hope that you find uh, a partner that you can be happy with. Um, I will not I will not tell you to to try it with women, but and and you're not young anymore. You're not young anymore. And it's it's really hard to start a completely new chapter in life when you reached a certain age. Um, but it's never too late. It's never too late. Um, and I don't want to, I don't want to convince you at all. I mean, you can, you can ask yourself and if, if the voice in your side, you says no, then, then don't do it. Don't do it for me. Don't do it for anybody else but yourself. But I really hope that you find happiness. Um, um, but don't choose a partner just because you're lonely if you don't feel the deep connection. But, um, Physical attraction is not the most important thing or that everything is, is, is perfect. The most important thing is values and that you, um, that this person brings out the best in you um, and that you can trust the person. These are the important things, I think. Um, okay. <laughs> he continues, like I said, I agree with some of what you say, but I can't make out if you're anti-gay or not. I don't see how you could be. Well, well, I would say I'm more homophobic than most other people that I know. Uh, but I think my homophobia uh, is in parts spirit from a spiritual nature because I saw so many gay people and LGBT people being broken and uh, bad experiences. Just being in the LGBT community and seeing so much toxic behavior. And when I started dating women again, I got, um, there was absolutely, there was almost no tolerance from the LGBT community towards a, a, a gay man actually starting to date a woman. Um, there's far less tolerance in the gay community than there is in the straight community. Um, next question. Uh, or statement gay and trans are two different things yes they are they are but i think both have to do with identity and i think that there are a lot of straight people that deeply struggle with their identity and i hope that people find their real i their real healthy unbroken identity and especially in regards to trans people or people that think they are trans i think the vast majority of people that think they are trans are just confused um, and go through an identity crisis, but not a gender identity crisis, uh, just an overall identity crisis. Um, I will get attacked for just saying that, but sorry, I think that's true, especially for younger people, but also for people of, yeah, midlife crisis people and stuff like that. Um, and 
Yeah, I think even if you're really trans, even I think even if you really, really have a gender dysmorphia, I don't know if changing your body is necessarily the right option. Maybe it is. Uh, but I think that most people that work in that field today just are too affirming instead of, instead of saying, look at the options and maybe you can be happy in your body and just like um, act differently, dress differently. Maybe that's enough. Maybe you can accept your body the way it is. Um, instead of instead of that, I, I would say taking hormones and all of that might just be the easy fit um, for big issues. Um, but I'm not an expert. But I think the experts that currently expert and lobbyists that currently dominate the field um, have an agenda and they don't work in the best interest of each individual. Next question. How do you think that men are abused as much or more by women? So now we, we change the topic a little bit. It's something that I said uh, about that um, domestic abuse. Uh, I continue reading his question. Especially after what happened to your mom. When I heard about that, I started praying for you. Thank you very much. And your brother. I can't even imagine what that must have been like. I... For me, it was fine because I had my faith and I know people will say, oh, it can't be fine. Of course. I mean, I was crying for half an hour, like just tears running out of my eyes. <laughs> to clarify, my, my mother was uh, killed by her second husband and I, me and my brother were listening to it while we were on the telephone with her. Um, so I was crying for like half an hour, like very intensely. But after that, after that half an hour, I immediately, I could literally see in front of me like the symbol of yin and yang. And I said to every negative, there is a positive. And I started thinking, what's the positive about the fact that mom was just killed? I know it sounds completely absurd and people will say, oh, that's just your coping mechanism. But no, no, that's just how my brain worked. And I think in most most cases it still is how my brain works i just things look at things from both sides and i can do that in quite stressful situations and at that point i thought well i'm i'm going to i'm going to learn from that experience it's going to be quite impactful in my life that's positive um i'm going to be more free because my me and my mother we work quite close emotionally um, and I could sense that the direction in which I was moving, w she didn't agree with that. So I think there sh would have been a schism between me and my mom at one point. Um, we, we would have come back together later on. Um, I'm sure of that. And uh, it would have been nice to have that experience as well. But I think that at that point, uh, her, her death actually, like, opened, opened um, the world for me and I could just in some ways go crazy. Well, now I, I, I complained earlier on that, uh, that I, I wish there had been a voice telling me not to go as crazy and maybe that voice would have been my mom. Who knows? Who knows? Maybe my mom would have said, come on, try it with women or, or don't go too crazy, just a little bit crazy. Who knows? Who knows? But I'm, yeah, I'm not... Uh, I'm, I'm still grateful for every experience that I made in my life. Uh, but now to the question, how do I think that men are abused as much or more um, by women? Now, there are different studies, and that's particularly in regards to domestic abuse. And it depends on what you include in domestic abuse. For example, uh, post-separation, abusive behavior, for example, alienating your children, um, and making false uh, accusation and stuff like that. Uh, in that case, I do think that there is more abuse from women towards men than the other way around. And I think there is more low-level violence from women towards men, like slapping a man and stuff like that, punching a man. Uh, when it comes to um, like deadly violence, then men are more, uh, more often deadly than w women. But I do think that we also have to look at suicide rates and the suicide rates for men are much higher than for women. 
And I think both men and women um, sometimes choose suicide to get out of an abusive relationship. And I think that's something that is not addressed. There is, however, um, a very big survey. It's an American survey about uh, bi-directional intimate partner violence. And that indicates that in 60% of cases of domestic abuse, both partners are actually abusive towards each other. And in the remaining 40%, uh, a slight majority, I think it's something between 60 and 70% of violence is initiated by women, not by men. But again, the more uh, the more impactful violence, as in like deadly force, is executed by men. There's no question about that. Um, yeah. Next question. We're almost through. Um, and this is uh, still referring to the death of my mom. Um, yet you seem to have more of an issue with her than with the man who abused her. I'm incorrect. Am I incorrect for thinking that? I'm not judging you. <laughs> That's it's a it's a good point. No, no, no. I I love my mom very, very dearly, very dearly. And I but I know my mom much better than the man, her second husband, who killed her. And I express more compassion for him because it's so hard to feel imp to feel compassion for people that do something painful like that. And and I've always I always defended the underdog in some ways. And he was South African. He grew up in apartheid Africa. He was white. He was a racist. Like he was a proper racist. And he, yeah, he was a weapons dealer and he was a leader of a killer commando. And in the end, he killed my mom. And all I can think is when you're a child, do you, do you say, do you know, I really want to become an abusive person and I want to uh, kill my former partner and then myself. So he committed suicide, suicide afterwards. And I just don't think that that's what we want. I don't excuse it because I do think we make choices in life and I think he could have chosen a better path at all stages of his life. So I do not excuse his behaviors, but I I pray I pray for his soul. I and if he hadn't killed himself, I would have visited him in prison and I would have told him I forgive you for what you did, but now you have to start doing good. Um use your time in prison to write a book helping people to get better. And if you said, I don't do, uh, regret what I did, then I would have said, well, then that's on you. I still pray for you. But if you don't change, um, then you're going to burn in hell. <laughs> um, yeah. So I'm, I'm a big fan of second chances, um, maybe third chances. But at one point, I it's not my duty to help you anymore. I hope that explains your questions uh, I don't judge I don't judge my mom for for her uh, decisions but she knew who she, who she was dating she knew he was a weapon stealer he knew he was a racist but she, she uh, my dad he's a dentist and I, I would say boring in some ways uh, I don't find him boring but he was boring back then in that context um, and she wanted uh, a James Bond or a James Bond villain and that that's what who she got into um, last, uh, last question. These are legit questions. I just really like to get inside your head and try to understand more. I'm a nice guy. I'm sure you are. Uh, I hope I hear back from you. As I said, this all fascinates me. As I start, uh, stated earlier, I am a Christian and I'm not the same person I once was, but I am still gay. I am still a gay man who believes in being in a monogamous relationship. And I have a lot of family values. And the Lord is the most important thing in my life. I really hope I hear from you. I'd love to learn more about you as a person, not the porn star. God bless and have a great weekend. Warmly and then his name. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your letter. I... I have a really hard time replying to letters and that's why I did the video and even that 
I, I can never do that again for you. So unfortunately, there will not be a lot of further back and forth. And I try to, I try to focus on my privacy in some ways. So if, if you reach out again, we can communicate short, but not in letters as long as this. I wish you all the best. I wish I do wish you all the best. And I. Yeah, I hope that you find the partner that is right for you. Um, in regards to family, I was always very, very critical of same sex and single parent adoption. But if there's somebody who completely falls through the gaps in the system, for example, if there's like a, a, a teenager or somebody, like if you find a partner and there's a kid that really needs help or that nobody else wants, then I, um, obviously I, I, I want somebody wonderful to look after this kid. And there's I, I see no reason why gay parents can't do that but you have to understand that you can't give a child everything they need they you can't give them the love of a mother so you have to think about that and that to me is a big issue that's why i'm not in favor of uh, single parent adoption and stuff like that where are you going to get the external influences from think about that um, and i wish you all the best Sorry, this was a very long video. I hope some people are going to watch this and uh, I'm so I'm I'm terribly sorry if I offend people with the things I say and if I come across as anti-gay, but everything I do, everything I say comes from a place of compassion for the individuals but also for society. Okay. Um see you in the next video. Bye.